Dragon Punch is a very small card game, everything fits in here. It's a small card two-player game, a combat game, each player represents a fighter inspired by the old video games of the, of the 1990s, and simply you are fighting and beating the heck out of each other, and if you are the player that manages to defeat the opponent, you win the game. Very short, very small game. It doesn't require Surface to play, even though we're going to use one in this review. And I have to say, there are many games that uh, present themselves to, on the market as small, portable, play everywhere, etc, etc. But I have to say, this is definitely uh, the one that does that the best and is hands down the one with the best presentation. I really like it. Because you may have those games that you can always carry with you, but they come in boxes or they come in those awkward bags, so all the components are at the bottom in a big bunch. Here, it looks like a credit card holder. You can actually put it in your pocket. You can actually carry it with you. It's really excellent presentation. It's in uh, soft, but very sturdy plastic. Incredibly, incredibly well done presentation here. Now, here in the central pocket, you have the characters in the game. You will choose one for each player. Suppose that these are the two characters that you're going to play. So each player gets one, the other one goes back in here. Nothing needs to say on the surface. Here we have the rule sheet, super small as you can see. And then of course we have the cards. Each player has an identical set of six cards, so once you add your character, then you will have a hand of seven cards. Each card, with the exception of your character card, is divided in two areas, a white one and a red one. At the beginning, all cards are placed in the way you're seeing them here, with the white half up on top and the red at the bottom. You probably already imagined this is also how you record hits and damage when you receive a hit. For each hit that you receive, you flip a card with the so that the red side is now up, is readable, and also uh, that means that, well, you're going down in health, and now, oh, I lost two health points on my initial, on my initial six. And what happens, though, is that as you do so, you're also getting more desperate, figuring out better ways of fighting, so you're unlocking new moves. I really like that. How does it work? Super simple. You look at your hand of cards and you decide the move that you want to attempt. If it is a move on your card card, then it can be on either side. The card card is the only one that can be turned either side. It doesn't matter. It's not recording anything. So suppose that I decide to have this move here. Whatever is the move, I put it simply in front of my packet of cards and my opponent does something similar, my opponent also gets to decide what they want to do and then we simply reveal our selections to each other. Rock, paper, scissors, yes, or more technically speaking simultaneous selection of action because here there is more than rock, paper, scissors. Then what happens simply is that we compare these two areas from the cards that we have decided. As you can see, each card representing a hit that you're trying to deliver or special move has two areas, high or low. Again, imagine video games from the 1990s when Chun-Li is, is, is kind of crushing down and trying to deliver a low kick or a high kick or maybe using other moves, a flurry of kicks. So I simply compare. What happens is that this simply represents a hit that you're trying to deliver. This number in the hit is the number of damage points or hit points that you inflict if it does hit. And this is the speed of the hit. Now, maybe your hit will be evaded. This means evading. So actually, if this is the situation, the opponent had chosen that car, this would have been evaded. This amounts to nothing. It's also possible to block a hit. So again, if this had been the selection, this hit would have been blocked. So basically, once you compare all possible results, uh, there will be one of the following scenarios. Nobody hit because all, all attacks were evaded or or blocked. There's also another effect uh, that can uh, that can block things. For example, if you're firing two projectile attacks at each other, which again, if you remember those video games, if you're firing a fireball and the opponent does the same, the two annul each other in the middle of the screen. So maybe nobody hit, 
or uh, both hit or only one player hit. If only one player hit, very simple, the opponent takes that amount of damage uh, as indicated by the hit that went through and simply the opponent flips both cards. In this case, two cards because that was a two point hit. One card if it's a one point hit. Easy, that easy. And again, if you all of your cards are turned face uh, well, turn upside down with the red side up, then you lost the game. But what happens if both uh, sides manage to hit at the same time? Then the tiebreaker, first tiebreaker is initiative. Initiative is a condition that you can receive due to certain game effects. It lasts for a single turn. So if you achieve it this turn, the next turn, when we are showing cards to each other, I have initiative. That means that I am gonna, I'm going to uh, break any tie. If neither of us, if we're still, uh, if we're tied because we both hit each other and uh, neither of us has initiative, or we both have it, have it so that they annul those announce each other, initiative, both players have initiative, no one has it. So if both are hitting and initiative is not a factor, then you look at the speed. Then the faster, the faster hit is the one with the lowest number here, and that is the one that inflicts damage on the opponent. The one that was delivered right before is the opponent was still setting up their hit, and uh, that when they're first. If no initiative is there, and there is a tie on speed, then both players hit at the same time, and you inflict the hit. After you have resolved uh, the confrontation by showing the cards to each other and seeing if things have been blocked, etc., etc., the card that you just used is flipped to the other side like this and you simply cannot use it for the time being it is temporarily locked it is temporarily used so each time that you use a certain hit then for a while you won't be able to use it uh, which is the difference between rock paper uh, scissor and this scissors and this game which is uh, there is a certain uh, there's a limited number of resources based on what the opponent is doing you get a better sense of what things are most likely to be used next time you know what to defend against you're looking for the moment when the opponent is putting up a weak defense based on what has already been used so there is a lot of that trying to read each other which is possible precisely because not all cards are equally available at all times if you want to refresh your hand then you need to play the taunt and at the end of your turn you unflip all of your cards including this one now your hand is freshed again fresh again and you can start again flipping them to record the fact that uh, they have been used and they cannot be used again until they are refreshed that uh, doesn't change the orientation that's nothing to do with the orientation but the orientation only depends on whether the card is being used to record a hit that was delivered or not this is it this is the game super simple super small and you can indeed play it without a surface you can play it as you're standing in line at the movie theater waiting to watch star wars episode 7 again you can you can play it on the bus you can play it in the car as you're as you're sitting there in a in a traffic jam definitely a lot of definitely of definitely of different uses for this game. One game that is marketed as, as played everywhere and it can indeed be played everywhere. So when thinking about a game like Dragon Punch of course the first uh, uh, comparison that comes to mind is rock paper scissors and that is both accurate and probably a little bit reductive. Even Rock Paper Scissors is not as silly of a game as, as most people seem to think. It is not just to throw there a random number. I mean that's what I thought until I read this book here, Uncertainty in Games by Greg Kostikian, um, where there is a very interesting game analysis of Rock Paper Scissors which I found surprising and it shows that even Rock Paper Scissors can have some strategy in general, not just based on reading what the opponent is throwing, but in general as, as a game. Uh, I found that fascinating, and you know what, if rock, paper, scissors can have some, not a lot, but some hidden depth, then probably Dragon Punch also may offer more than just throwing out a random card or figuring out one or two basic things. It does remain a very lean, a very simple game, actually a mini game. So it's small, the number of options is not big, but the point is, is it rewarding? Is the game worth playing for what it has to offer? 
the trade-off of of course not immense depth is that on the other hand on, on the plus side uh, you have uh, portability you have simplicity you have a game that is not too expensive because it's not materially too imposing I have to say uh, when it comes to games of this type uh, uh, select a card, show it and resolve the situation in a two-player duo, uh, I would play Dragon Punch any day of the week as opposed to Yomi. Yomi to me has this other problem that is not much more than Rock, Paper, Scissors. Scissors. It's not much more than Dragon Punch, but it's big, it's expensive, and I think it takes long, longer than it should, and it takes itself way too seriously. This is, this is my experience with Yomi and why I was never all that excited about that game. To me, this uh, Dragon Punch is a game that may not be much more than Rock, Paper, Scissors, but it is something more, and it doesn't take itself too seriously, and it doesn't try to uh, disguise that something more is a lot more. It's a really small, fun game, which is portable, you can play it anywhere, you can teach it to anybody, and it is still engaging for those 5-10 minutes it takes to play, because it has some fun actions, it has the, the psychological duel, it has the bluffing element, and it does have some simple, very simple, but fairly solid game mechanics that have to do with the gradual exhaustion of possibilities. That is something that you have to deal when it comes to your own uh, resources that are getting depleted, and you need to find the right time to refresh them. And of course, you're taking into account the same situation that the opponent is facing, um, so that you get, can get a better sense of what uh, the opponent may be, may be doing next. So, small game, mini game, I don't know it will be the best game, the favorite game in everybody's collection, but I think it can be a very nice addition to many people's collections, and maybe you don't even need to add it to your collection, you simply put it in your pocket, you add it to your collection in a broader sense, but it's not gonna go on the game shelf that was never meant uh, this game was never meant to go uh, to go there to be used stored revered in that fashion it's a game that you can carry around play anywhere and most importantly as a mini game it is one that is enjoyable and indeed pretty fun to play